But anyway, um, thank you very much for the um, this wonderful invitations. Um, I'm Junichi Yamagishi, and uh, we have yeah, his name is Shin Wan. Uh, we jointly give uh, tutorials on a uh, neural vocoders. Uh, especially, we want to introduce several type of neural vocoders, including autoregressive ones, source filter ones, uh, also glottal vocoder ones. In the lectures yesterday, I presume you already study neural autoregressive ones, but we will try to give you <coughs> different ways to interpret those models. Also, we try to explain the relationship between them. And, and also, since we are now working on not only speech, but also uh, music signals, uh, we also talk about those topics in later part. Xinhua mainly talk about those points. By the way, um, as Yanin said, um, if you have any questions during our lectures, please don't hesitate. Um, please interrupt us anytime. You know, it's not, how can I say, it's not um, comfortable for me to continue to display for three hours. It would be nice if you have some like a social feedback or <laughs> audio feedback from your side at some point. But anyway, let's start. Um, Um, so first of all, I'm professor at NII in Japan. I graduated from signal processing group who um, proposed Kepstan vocoders quite a long time ago. Um, but my supervisor at the time suggested me to work on machine learning at signal processing group, and therefore I studied hidden Markov models at the time. But um, since I was, how can I say, um, educated, those kind of like a vocoder topics, I was given um, wonderful opportunities to work with Professor Pav Aoku on Grotao vocoders and its statistical modeling. I was also given another opportunities to work with uh, Yanis on sinusoidal vocoders. Uh, it's it's a uh, uh, statistical modelings. So I will try to talk not only neural vocoders, but also those kind of um, so-called traditional vocoders, because it's quite relevant to the current neural vocoders, in my opinion. Um, uh, yes, uh, I'm currently a postdoc and, and I graduate from the same lab. Uh, I was working on the uh, many on text-to-speech synthesis, especially the fundamental frequency modeling. Uh, after I graduated from I, I started to working on the uh, neural vocoders, especially the neural source filter vocoders. So that's that's the uh, reason that I, I will give the uh, presentation about the NASF today neural source filter model. Right. So um, this is the agenda of our lecture today. Um, in the first part, we will quickly explain what is a vocoders. In the next part, we will explain how does the vocoders work. Um, there are three parts in this section. The part one is the overview of autoregressive vocoders. And the part two is the source filter vocoders and the part three is for glottal vocoders. Then after that, we will move on to musical instrument part. In the second sections, we will actually overview many vocoders, um, as you shown here. I think in total there are probably 15 vocoders, including non-neural ones and the neural ones. I understand that most of you are interested in neural ones, but I will quickly explain non-neural ones for each because um, because it's theoretically it's quite relevant 
And also, once you understand non neural ones, actually, we could understand why neural ones are better than the traditional ones so deeply. In part one and part two, I will explain um, auto regressive vocoders such as LPC as the non neural ones, and also uh, as a neural auto regressive vocoders, we will talk about WebNet, Pi WebNet quickly, as well as WebGrow and the WebFlow. Since um, this topic is not only, how can I say, uh, relevant to waveform generations, but also so-called representation learnings in machine learning field, I will also quickly mention how those models are useful for learning a meaningful representations for downstream task. <clears throat> then um, I will talk about all the book orders, but still um, important in my opinion, which is Kepustan book orders, mixed excitations, and the straight, and so on. And then after that, Shin Wan, for short XW, we will talk about his uh, decent vocoders, quite wonderful new vocoders called Neural Source Filter, for short NSF. Then we will go to advanced topics. This is most challenging part, so I hope you all of you follow those sections because it has, um, how can I say, quite advanced signal processing and machine learning topics in this part two, three we introduce harmonics plus noise format, uh, trainable excitations, and even reverberations. Then um, probably you wonder the difference those models. So I will, we will clarify the difference between those models and also a relevance to uh, most decent models like uh, uh, WaveGAM or MailGAM. Then we will come back to Grotal models like LF or inverse adaptive filterings. And then after that, I will talk about its neural um, variants such as GrotalNet, GELP, or LPCNet. So those part three will become nice introductions for your lectures in day three. Expected audience and outcomes. So Shinwan and I prepare those slides uh, for student who already use deep learning to some extent, but um, not familiar with signal processing or vocoder so much. Yesterday I checked participants and I found a couple signal processing experts. Um, for such an exceptional audience, those talk might not be so, how can I say, um, interesting, but um, at least um, overview of the neural vocoders we talk should be useful for anyone. What we try to teach in these lectures are um, the visual concept of traditional and uh, neural vocoders and uh, also theoretical and the fundamental differences between them and the close relationships. So we will, we will not talk about equations too much because um, I like figure or I like visual understanding. So we have many figures in this lectures. Um, instead, um, we will not teach details configurations vocoders such as you know number of the layers, type of network, or type of activation layers, or dimensions, and so on. So we will not teach those kind of boring stuff. Instead, we try to give you how can I say concept um, or differences or between the neural vocoders. 
then um, after the talk, probably you will understand that uh, speech signal processing and the machine learning processing uh, have close overlap, although they use different terminology each other. But actually, um, what we try to solve in these two fields are relevant to each other. OK, so let's go to part one. Um, Xinwan, do you want to say something apart from what I said earlier? So far? Oh, it's OK. It's OK. OK, good. All right, so, um, so let's define vocoders or machine learning task as a vocoder as a machine learning task. Um, I think task is a simple. The task is to generate a speech waveform sample, so from given acoustic features. Those acoustic features could be spectrum envelope or other type of features, like a linguistic features, or other information like a fundamental frequency. But uh, um, sometimes they are called conditional features because uh, those features become conditions to generate speech waveforms. But simply speaking, uh, you could assume this is an input. Input is acoustic features, and we want to generate speech waveform sample. In this slide, uh, we use um, mathematical notations like this. We use uh, variable C as a conditional futures or acoustic futures. C1, C2, C3, and so on are time indexes. Uh, so conditional futures are different frames at time. One, two, three, four, and n are time indexes. We input those futures for coders to generate waveform samples. Um, O1, O2, O3, and so on. <clears throat> if we use PCM, normal PCM waveform format, O1 could be scalar value, as you know. But uh, if we, for instance, quantize waveform um, using murals, for instance, O1 could be vectors. So depending on the vocoders you want to use, there are several format of input and acoustic features. The most basic format of the waveform is, uh, yeah, of course, linear PCM. Um, but instead of this format, sometimes we also use continuous values waveform or quantized waveform. In any cases, we use uh, same notation O in this lectures. Um, examples of input acoustic features are um, Kepstan, filter banks, and so on. So they are, are features representing spectrum envelope. We may also use other features like fundamental frequency or APODCT parameters to provide some um, noise information in high frequency part. Since some of you might not be so familiar with um, signal processing or how we extract futures, um, I try to visualize how we get those um, acoustic futures. So if you segment speech waveform, especially vowel regions, um, you could see those kind of speech waveforms, which has um, like, a, how can I say, similar patterns repeated. So you could see similar waveforms are repeated several times. So if you apply um, like a time to frequency conversions, um, called short-term Fourier transform, you can understand which frequency is uh, strong and which frequency is, is dominant. For instance, so you can see that those regions 
uh, uh, dominant frequencies of those speech segments. But in the meantime, you could also see that um, those speech signal has many um, speech, so many frequencies mixed. If you don't know the uh, theoretical background of those Fourier transform, um, you could imagine this is almost equivalent to prism. Prism is uh, some, um, how can I say, interesting um, um, like a crystal like things that transform the light to colors. Um, the light is a, of course waveform and the color is a frequencies. So Fourier transform also does similar conversion from time to frequency. But um, as you can see, there's too many point in this frequency domain after the Fourier transform, which is a bit, little bit um, challenging for um, machine learnings to handle. So we typically apply post-processing, such as uh, male filter banks or um, Kepstan transform. Filter banks basically apply and band pass filters, which I will show the next slide, to represent auditory scales and also uh, to perform uh, dimensional deductions. On the other hand, Kepstan perform a few additional things over filter banks. Kepstan does decorrelations among the those point of frequency. It also removes F0 information through lifting. In any case, we, what we have after those processing is basically spectrum envelope, uh, as shown in this figure. For auditory scalings, um, male scale is uh, quite typical, but in addition to the male, we may use um, other auditory scales uh, like bark or arb scale. So those, the left figure on the top shows the relationship between linear frequency and the warped frequencies. So there are some differences between those frequencies, but Point A is those solitary scales provide um, more resolutions onto low frequencies because low frequency is more important for speech signals. After we have those uh, warped frequency scale, we basically place uh, filters, um, equalities on the warped frequency scale which becomes um, filter banks um, placement, like light figures. Basically, we have many filters in low frequency part, as you could see. Oops, sorry. And then we have few filters on the light frequency part. Um, by the way, um, Shinwan and I now give uh, lectures at home so sometimes my kids might jump in to <laughs> interrupt my lectures. In such case, uh, probably Shinwan will take over and will carry on the lectures. So I hope I can carry on my lectures as, as long as I can. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's, that's after okay. the... we, can, we can also filter the, you know, we will edit the video after that, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. He might also wish to study, you know. Um, anyway, um, after the filtering using those filter banks, so basically um, we will have simplified um, spectrums like blue curves at the bottoms. By the way, so let... I have a question here. Again. Uh, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Yeah, have you okay. try? I mean, I see that a lot of people use male uh, filter banks for um, neural vocoders. Um, have you tried for the same vocoder, neural vocoder, to compare ERB, male, and bark and see which one provides better results and compare uh, as a function, for instance, of the gender, 
if it is tonal language, not tonal language, if there is any, any uh, work around that? Um, that's a good question. Um, I haven't done uh, comparisons of audio auditory scale for neural vocoder by myself, but mm -hmm. Shinwan did the comparisons of um, waveform representations. He compared male filter banks and the male capstan and he find that, found that uh, filter banks would be better than male capstan. I think somebody else also did similar um, um, investigation in the, in the past. Um, I did some relevant investigations for training HMM, not neural vocoders, and I compare those three uh, auditory scales. According to like uh, HMM training result, um, the bark scale was uh, the better, the male was uh, second, and the herb scale was the worst. But I don't know if this is true for neural vocoders or not. Okay, thank you. That's a good question. Um, but point, point, point is, um, after the male filterings, um, FFT point, which is shown in the red, can be simplified with um, the blue curves, as you see in the figure bottoms. Basically, those blue curves capture spectrum envelopes in middle frequency and the high frequency part of, sorry. But um, in the low frequency part, those filtering so it made the filter bank output capture the harmonic structures. So I will come back to this point in section two later. Since this is a just overview of the neural vocoders, um, I just want to explain the relevant task like a copy synthesis, TTS and the voice conversions. Some of you already work on those. But, uh, in our definitions, and copy synthesis is a task to extract acoustic futures from weapon and <clears throat> synthesize speech using vocoders. In some sense, this is it's kind of like an autoencoder-like task if I use machine learning um, terminology. On the other hand, TTS and the voice conversion use different type of conditional futures. <clears throat> TTS use a text as an input, voice conversion use a speech data uttered by somebody else as an input, and then those model predict or generate acoustic futures required for vocoders and the vocoder generate waveform samples. So this is a um, quick overview of what is a vocoders. Now we go to the second part how does the vocoder work? We will introduce um, over 15 different type of vocoders, as I explained earlier. <clears throat> I want to introduce um, most um, simple, simplest vocoders, um, but still quite important um, vocoders, which is um, linear air models. The linear air models means basically we predict waveform sample n at time n or n based on weighted sum of past waveform sample plus uh, noise e. This is quite simple assumptions but it's quite suitable for speech and it has been used for speech field for over um, nearly 70 years. <clears throat> and this is called linear predictive coding um, because it uses linear weighted sum or pass waveform samples. So A is, is called autoregressive questions because uh, using waveform sample itself to predict next waveform sample. So it's a 
it's kind of like an old predictions based on past samples. So typical numbers are waveform samples used for predictions, of course, bodies, depending on the data or task, but uh, those are relatively limited and then values are like a 10 to 16. So as you could see from those illustrations, uh, if you wish to predict waveform samples in red here, sorry, let me use a pen. If you wish to predict this, uh, those models, what those model does is simple. We basically check the past waveform sample and consider its weighted sum. It's a relatively simple, but it works pretty well. Um, this is the how normally apply those LPC to speech waveform. We apply frames to get um, segmented speech waveform. Then for each segment, so we compute optimal um, LPC questions, autoregressive questions. If we use TTS or voice conversion task, we predict those LPC questions from text or source speaker instead of using um, LPC questions extracted input frames. And then we will generate speech weapon back through overlap art. Um, if we use TTS voice conversions, um, we normally use um, like a, another format of LPCs called line spectral pairs instead of LPC questions directly um, because of the stability issues, which we will also explain part two one. <clears throat> But probably you might um, haven't thought how we compute those uh, generation part from given uh, LPC questions. The most naive way to generate speech waveform sample from given LPC questions is, is actually autoregressive generations <laughs> like WebNet as you study. Uh, from WebNet, we predict fast waveform sample and using those predicted waveform sample, we predict next waveform sample and we continued those uh, process until you predict or generate all waveform sequences. But uh, actually we don't do that um, and there's um, Similar research to non-autoregressive <laughs> research like machine learning people does right now. Um, there are some clever solutions to speed up this LPC generations. That is non-autoregressive generations. So instead of um, repeating those left to right predictions, we compute a frequency so SDFT or LPC questions and apply those frequency representations of LPC to um, the GDL signal E um, using a few tasks defined by A. Why this computation is a faster than naive way? That is because we can perform those process at each frame independently. The here i is a frame index, so we could perform those um, LPC questions to waveform conversions independently at each frames. Um, I borrow those equations from lecture books, but if I use machine learning term, basically we use uh, mean square errors to estimate um, autoregressive questions, meaning basically we compute uh, residuals between 
Grand Tilu's waveform at time n and the predicted waveform at time n, which is sum of um, p um, weighted sum values, as you, as you could see from this here. And we compute the square errors of those errors. Then we look for um, LPC questions, which is A, A, 1, 2, P. <clears throat> this is most basic way to estimate LPC questions that minimize those um, energy or the GDLs. But uh, of course, there's many ways to compute those um, LPC questions. We may compute other spectrum envelope like Kepstan, then we may convert Kepstan to LPCs. But anyway, um, <clears throat> I will stop speaking about signal processing because many students might feel sleepy if I continue to speak those kind of signal processing. So let's change the uh, topics to neural net suddenly. Uh, but um, I will talk about in between models, uh, meaning like a waveform models in between LPC and the wave, wave, wave net <clears throat> as a starting point so that we could gradually derive wave net from LPC. We have another motivation to explain this in between models because this model is also relevant to LPC net that you will study tomorrow. So please let me explain those neural linear autoregression models where basically we use, we still use linear autoregressive equations A, but we predict waveform sample O using neural network. So this new symbol A, <clears throat> this one is a neural network now. In LPC, uh, the relationship between waveform sample and uh, the past waveform sample was linear deterministic. But um, here we consider neural network to predict waveform sample at time n using linear error questions. And just for your, just to remind, just to recap your memory, um, C is a conditional futures, and then this notation represent a set of past waveform samples. So how can we do this? So actually, it's quite simple, actually. So let's consider feed for neural network probably you was told many complicated neural network yesterday, but um, as I said earlier, we like figure, we like visual understanding. So let's start with feed forward. But using this feed forward, let's predict waveform sample with LPCs, which becomes basically this network. So you could see that um, condition C is an uh, input. So those may be up samples to align the time differences between frames and waveform sample. But it doesn't matter. Um, we could simply repeat conditional futures so that the total length becomes match with the waveforms. We first predict um, Gaussian distributions from those conditional futures through feed forward. But those Gaussian distributions have some <clears throat> constraints shown here. <clears throat> Observations at time n has dependencies to previous waveform sample and also previous, previous waveform samples. 
So in other words, this is the second order uh, autoregressive models. If we draw, if we explain these models using probabilistic form, it becomes like this. Uh, probability O, so given LPC conventions, <clears throat> set of LPC conventions and conditional futures can be represented a product of each probability at time n. Then each probability at time n would be estimated by feed for network that use conditional future C. Of course, we could use um, recurrent neural network instead of um, feed forward by adding some um, dependency between the state, like this figure. But still, um, point is, it's attaching autoregressive questions A to the output. Probably some of you wonders why we need to have such a uh, autoregressive questions between output. Maybe RNN could be sufficient because since we have time dependency over time, maybe the current neural network might capture such a autoregressive information sufficiently. And actually, answer is no. RNN doesn't capture such a time dependency of observations for speech waveforms. I will explain this point explicitly from now. So I, here, I simplify the previous models further. The still almost the same network, but I reduce the number of RNN to one. I also reduce the number of AR, LPC, to just one dimensions. If you do that, you could explicitly write down <coughs> mean vectors of the Gaussian distributions at each time step as follows. It's not, so e this is quite easy. You can maybe, if you have a few minutes, you can write down these equations. But point is, um, those mean vectors has, um, has dependencies onto A, and also pass waveform sample O1, because um, if you rewrite those equations, um, using multinominal form instead of diagonal format, you can easily understand that covariance term becomes not diagonal anymore. Even if you use RNN, the covariance matrix of observation one and observation two are diagonals, meaning the output are IID. On the other hand, um, if we attach AR questions to RNN, like this figure, the output has a full covariance matrix like this, and therefore it's not IID anymore. So this is the fundamental difference between autoregressive models and RNN. So after we attach sub, such AI questions, um, how do we generate speech waveforms? Um, of course, um, we may <coughs> simply estimate those AI parameters from conditions, but it's also possible to estimate the uh, GDLs between target waveforms and predicted waveforms E, and those residual E may be predicted by other models shown here. It's named residual modelings. This is um, for visualizations, we divided those two part 
to two components, but um, this is mathematically equivalent. <coughs> so in other words, um, we could estimate those um, <coughs> air coefficients and also um, the models. Another model that um, to predict residual uh, component E at the same time from seed. Sorry, somebody game. I will stop Slack. Somebody continue to send me messages. <clears throat> As, so this is the this was the training at inference. We do basically inverse processing from given conditional futures like a spectrum envelope or other type of futures like uh, apodicity or fundamental frequency, we first predict residual signals E and then apply um, autoregressive generations. And we will get final output. So this format is actually quite relevant to both WebNet and also LPCNet. If we advance those linear air modeling part further, it will become um, nonlinear autoregressive models and also WebNet. If we advance and improve those digital modeling part further, it will become um, LPCNet or other type of <coughs> glottal vocoders you, uh, you will see shortly. <coughs> First, <clears throat> in this part, please let me <clears throat> explain <clears throat> those <clears throat> linear air models a little bit further. <clears throat> so if you study LPC when you are a student, uh, probably you are told that um, autoregressive questions uh, predicted by HMM Gaussians or vector quantizations are not stable and therefore we have to check the orders, orders of line frequency pairs to, <clears throat> to guarantee that synthesis filter becomes stable and so on. If you haven't studied signal processing probably you don't understand what I'm saying but point is those problem happens to DNN as well. Autoregressive questions estimated back propagations may be unstable if you estimate those um, battery. So we have to guarantee that autoregressive questions estimated through back propagations are stable. Um, we can do this. Um, by using similar tricks to um, LPC. Um, how do we do it? Um, probably this is too technical for me to explain here within one minute. So ideally it's better to check Xin Wan's um, past papers, but uh, there's one um, sufficient conditions to estimate stable air parameters. So this is not sufficient and necessary conditions and therefore, how can I say, it's not perfect solutions, but at least it's a sufficient conditions. So what we can do is transform autoregressive questions to log error ratios, notated gammas. <clears throat> then if we use sigma functions, so that um, the, the values of the gamma to be between zero and one, then um, this autoregressive generation is um, stable. Otherwise, you might have unstable autoregressive equations. We can prove this from, we can prove this theoretically, uh, and therefore we could integrate those constraints as a part of um, optimization 
uh, loss functions to constrain um, backward computations. But um, of course, <clears throat> there's more simpler solutions, um, which is extending autoregressive models into nonlinear autoregressive models. In previous part one to A, um, we uh, we were talking about neural network models, but the autoregressive questions are still uh, linear. So from now, we will consider <clears throat> neural models that models autoregressive dependencies in nonlinear ways, which includes a webnet and a parallel webnet. And therefore, part of this section is overlap with uh, lectures given by Vasilis yesterday, but probably our view would be slightly different from his. So I hope those sections are a little bit complementary. So in previous part, previous linear autoregressive neural network cases, <clears throat> we assume that waveform support at time n can be approximated using linear weighted sum or pass p samples, but we will extend these assumptions further. Uh, more specifically, we assume that waveforms at time n can be better approximated using nonlinear transform of huge pass waveform samples, like 3,000 pass waveform samples. So instead of using just 10, we use 3,000 pass waveforms, and then we further apply nonlinear transform. That is the uh, uh, motivation of <clears throat> the neural network we will explain in these sections. How can we achieve this? Actually, it's simple. Solution, simplest solution is just a feedback predicted waveform samples to hidden state. That's it. By doing that, basically, um, we can carry forward the past information to the futures for forever. The information of waveform sample at time one will be fed back to one of the hidden state. Then that will be used to the predictions of waveform at time two, and that go to state, hidden state again. <clears throat> if we attach RNN, those informations of state would be carried forward to the futures. And therefore, if RNN remembers all the information in the past, we can carry it forward all the information of the past waveform samples to predict next waveform point. Instead of RNN, a field fault, of course, we may use other type of architectures like 1D CNN or directed convolution neural network. <clears throat> The difference between 1D and the CNN is quite small, but instead of RNN, so basically we use the state of the other time index, as you could see from those two figures. So for instance, um, the state, this state has dependencies to um, to hidden state, but at different hierarchical layers. On the other hand, um, for instance, those state has dependencies to this guy, and uh, also another state far away in the past. But probably some of you might not use a CNN before, so I, we try to visualize how CNN works. 
the here we assume 1D CNN instead of 2D CNN. 1D CNN is basically uh, filtering if I use signal processing terminologies. We have filters and then we have um, vector sequence. In the case of input layers, uh, those would be acoustic features, C. In the case of the intermediate layers, um, those vector sequences are um, output of um, previous hidden state. <clears throat> so basically, we apply those uh, filters onto vector sequence like this. Then we computed uh, weighted sum of those filter values and input vectors. Then we repeat this process until we get final output. The difference between filtering and the 1D convolution is quite small, in my opinion. Filter questions are estimated through back propagations. Dilated convolutions apply those filters um, to waveform in similar way, but um, we apply those filters per, say, two samples. You may skip a few number of samples like this so that we could capture a um, more longer <coughs> time span with the same number of uh, filter parameters. So basically, um, by using those dilated convolutions, and then repeated process, uh, also auto non-linear autoregressive modelings, um, it becomes WebNet. Uh, Stick speaking, the famous figures using WebNet papers. Of course, WebNet has more little bit more details like uh, um, gated activations and other, other tricks. <clears throat> if you want to know more details, you could see Bashiri's slide again or our appendix. <clears throat> we have some additional information. The point is the key concept of WebNet is nonlinear autoregressive modeling through dilated convolutions. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, so far, we explained um, one type of input, which is C. Um, but since this is a neural network, we may use other type of input. Then those input may have different <clears throat> information from local conditional features, which we explained so far. So those are useful to train uh, WebNet, for instance, TTS. <coughs> for the WebNet TTS, we use speaker and language, the labels, as a global time invariant features. Um, then input <coughs> linguistic embedded features plus F0. And then we predict speech waveforms. On the other hand, um, for WebNet vocoders, uh, we input acoustic features. Sometimes we input speaker embedding vector as S in this figure, but <clears throat> it seems that acoustic feature seems to be sufficient. Um, so this WebNet, um, as you already tried yesterday uh, proves that this models can produce high quality speech waveforms and then turned out much nicer than previous vocoders at the time. But there's a um, tricky problem, which is slow inference. 
So since the so wave net predict the wave form sample from left to right, then use and uh, use the predicted wave form sample for nonlinear autoregressive modelings. Inference time is proportional to wave form length n, meaning um, wave form time. So prediction time may become extremely slow if we want to generate um, very long waveform sequence. This is impractical um, because um, speech synthesis need to generate speech waveforms in real time, as you know. Um, <clears throat> and therefore, um, I think you also study this part WebNet, but this part by WebNet um, introduced um, two new concepts, which is invertible neural network and uh, normalization flow <clears throat> to speed up basically inference time. Um, the key concept of those invertible neural network and normalization flow is as follows. For training, so basically we still want to use a powerful neural network and then we may spend out of time to train good models, but um, we want to somehow convert those neural network into efficient mode so that we could generate <coughs> speech waveform sample efficiently. Then again, most time consuming part is autoregressive assumptions or dependency as you saw. And therefore, this conversion basically try to remove autoregressive dependency somehow. For training, we still use autoregressive dependency but for inference, we transform the functions f inverse to f to remove the autoregressive dependencies. So in other words, um, <clears throat> at inference time, so basically we want to generate speech signals from white noise sequence. On the other hand, at training, uh, we wish to transform the waveform sequence O into white noise sequence C. But this is quite challenging because <laughs> the mapping from speech to white noise, of course it's possible, but it's not learnable. So what we can do is we apply such a transformations gradually and repeat such a operations many times to remove temporal correlations of speech gradually. So as you can see from those figure at bottoms, we applied neural network F, which is invertible, to remove temporal correlations gradually and make it close to white noise sequence generated from <coughs> Gaussian distributions. Uh, since this time, uh, we generate white noise sequence, which is independent each frame, and therefore we don't need to do like a left to right waveform generations. Then we applied embodied functions trained to those white noise sequence so that we can gradually change the back to waveform, to speech waveforms. <clears throat> this is concept of um, normalizing flow. And then since this try to remove autoregressive um, dependency from inference time, so it's called um, inverse autoregressive flow. This is quite nice um, because um, inference is faster, much faster. It's no more proportional to waveform lengths, but um, I'm, I'm afraid on the other hand, training time becomes extremely slow because we need to use autoregressive uh, trainings instead of inference. And therefore, 
training time becomes longer and also it's it becomes slow to converge. And therefore uh, in the papers proposed from DeepMind and they use additional tweaks, which is teacher student training to accelerate such a slow autoregressive trainings. Um, basically they train the normal webnet and then they try to use those pre-trained webnet as the teachers to speed up the training of student waveform models. Student models um, has inverse autoregressive flow, um, but it's slow. So compared slow, slower to original WebNet, so it requires more epochs. Even for normal WebNet, it takes quite a long time to train. So student model takes forever to train. And therefore, through teacher and the student framework, um, basically we try to provide more information from um, air student, so air WebNet to non-air uh, WebNet models. Um, in the end, it becomes very complex implementations. Of, I don't know, um, somebody tried to implement Pahu WebNet, but <laughs> it's, it's really complex because it has autoregulacy flow, teacher and student constraint, and also other type of constraint like uh, STFT rules or what they like. So it's, it's nice framework, but it's quite complex. And then many of researchers claim that um, it's not easy to train because of those complex architectures. And therefore, um, NVIDIA's uh, also Baidu uh, propose more efficient uh, models. The tricky part was inverse air fraud, which is a powerful, but it's quite slow to train. So basically in this wave growth and the wave fraud, they give up to models to proper autoregressive dependencies of entire sequence, but instead they try to models dependency within a frame. O1 to OT. They are calling this framing options as like a squeezing operations or like such a stupid name, but basically it's basically framing options. So basically we segment speech waveforms into many frames. Each of them has a T waveform point. Then <clears throat> this, those models try to land um, dependencies between such a short say, short speech waveform and the noise sequence. I wrote many texts here, but uh, the figure bottom is quite easy to understand. In the left one is the dependency or relationship between uh, waveform point and also um, latent model by white noise. So instead of entire waveform sequence, wave flow consider only <clears throat> eight waveform point, quite short frames. <clears throat> then those models try to decorrelate those eight waveform point only and transform them into white noise sequence but white noise sequence also has only eight point only. Then those models repeat those um, operations many times so that um, we could get true um, white noise sequence after decorrelations. <clears throat> Wave growth um, 
use a um, little bit weird dependency shown in right figure bottoms. It models a dependency on the half of waveform point within short frame and transform such a short half of the waveform into white noise sequence. In the next operations, basically they swap the <laughs> um, areas where we apply such a flow transform and repeat those operations uh, many times. So those operations, as you could see, is quite simplified, um, meaning it's a low capacity transform compared to nonlinear autoregulacy models. And therefore, we need to apply um, the correlation transform many times due to such a low capacity float. So in the end, it becomes, again, slow to train. Um, Wave growth um, takes two months to train because of those um, low capacity float. It doesn't have autoregressive assumptions, but it has many layers for nonlinear <coughs> nonlinear deep correlations between speech waveforms. So it's still slow to train. So wave from wave float proposed by Wabing is. Um, how can I say, has a good compromise um, ability. Um, it has better capacity than wave growth. Also, it also requires less uh, number of flow transform compared to wave growth. <clears throat> but, um, there's more efficient way to generate speech waveform. So that is the um, neural source filter models and also um, growth models, which we will explain in part two and the part two, three, no, sorry, part three. <clears throat> but before that, um, I want to quickly talk about another relevant topic, which is the presentation learning, um, because I simply like this topic uh, because uh, neural waveform models can be used for other purpose, meaning um, future uh, extractions. So good example of this is the um, autoregressive predictive coding um, predicted by a James Glass group. It has same um, or similar task to vocoders, um, basically from past waveform sample. Um, <clears throat> they try to predict future waveform sample, but uh, they try to predict not, not the next sample, but waveform sample at k step ahead. So as you could see from this, equations. The neural network has an input, <coughs> which is um, waveform sampled from a time one to time n, and also residuals. Uh, using those input, those, this neural network predict uh, waveform sampled a uh, k-step ahead. <coughs> ahead. Of course, this K depends on the task, also features that you use. Uh, but they propose these models as representation learnings, meaning um, they are not interested to generate speech waveform. Instead, they are inter interested in using <coughs> hidden features learned um, from the data. They assume that a uh, neural network basically train in this way, um, basically compress all the past informations to predict um, waveform sample at k step ahead. And therefore, the output of intermediate layers must be meaningful 
<clears throat> for another type of downstream task like speech recognition so speaker like it's turned out to be true <clears throat> so they are now investigating um, more sophisticated um, input network to <clears throat> to learn uh, the presentations, meaningful representation of downstream task from um, waveform or through autoregressive models. Um, I need to delete this comment. Okay. Another topic which we will quickly mention is <clears throat> Vector quantized variational autoencoders, VKVAE for short. This is also quite nice models for representation learning from futures. So motivation is similar to APC, autoregressive predictive codings, which I mentioned earlier, but this model tried to extract futures from speech waveform and then further try to um, discret discretize the, the futures. Then <clears throat> this, <clears throat> they propose to use those discretized latent for other uh, tasks. Um, the models is trained in autoencoder manners. Um, after we extract discrete latent, those discrete latent is used as an input to the WebNet to generate speech waveform. And therefore, we could train those models <coughs> without using any labels. They assume that the learned discrete latents capture phonetic information and automatically, and therefore must be quite useful for low resource speech recognitions or low resource speech to speech translations. <laughs> Recently, this model is also applied to um, music. Um, tanda also is turned out quite um, useful for um, singing and the music generation as well. All right, so um, Shima, am I? Probably I should speak a little bit faster, right? Yes. Uh, do you need to take a break? I think this is also uh, your part. Um, I think we could carry on a little bit more uh, <clears throat> if everyone is happy. <laughs> no, no, it's up to you. Um, I, mean, I will quickly. Uh, oh. You can ask quickly, but probably there are questions, you know. Uh, so, uh, guys, is there any question? Uh, hello, yeah, I would have a quick one, if I may. Um, sure, of course. So at some point you said that um, in this autoregressive uh, models, uh, linear and nonlinear ones, you can choose to model the coefficients or the residual, and this is mathematically equivalent, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But is this also computationally or uh, in a training manner equivalent? I mean, is there one of the two, which is better? Shimba, um, can you go back to the um, slide where we explain um, linear AR models 26? Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> so basically, we simply um, format equations using new variable E and then uh, we try to predict um, E from condition C. Um, uh, but I think this is a model proposed Xin Wan, so I will let Xin Wan to speak his opinion. Okay. Um, yes, I, I think your question is about uh, asking um, whether we predict the residual or predict the LPC coefficients, right? Yeah, so I, I also understand that, I mean, theoretically, this is the same thing, right? I can get one out of the other, but uh, yes. 
Um, I mean, yes. is it also practically the same thing? Is one better than the other in the quality or? Um, it depends on the application. I mean, uh, for example, for speech, well, this model showing here is mainly used for predicting other kinds of uh, one-dimensional signals, such as the fundamental frequency of the speech. So in that case, uh, the LPC coefficients part can be very simple. We can use the same coefficients for all the time point. But in this case, the re residual must be predicted from the linguistic features. Uh, but for other kinds of applications, for example, uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, what's the name? Uh, glotal uh, DN or glotal net. In that case, it's more important to predict the uh, LPC coefficients from the network. In that case, they just directly, oh, well, no, 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 it's not the way. Uh, they, they also need to predict the uh, E, the excitation from the uh, input acoustic features. Uh, but I mean, just depends on the application. Sometimes we can directly use time invariant uh, coefficients A here for all the time steps. Sometimes we need to also predict the A from the input features. Um, I, it's, it's hard to say uh, which one is better. It really depends on the application. I also want to clarify a few points. Um, <clears throat> so in this models, um, we don't have two step training, like uh, AR estimations, followed by uh, like uh, standard LPC models, so LPC estimations, followed by um, RNN training. Um, so those LPC questions, LPC-like questions A and RNN parameters uh, jointly together using back propagations. On the other hand, um, the LPC net or Groto net, the so UVC data, um, estimate those two parameters separately. Um, <clears throat> typically, we estimate LPC questions in standard way, then we compute LPC residuals in advance, then we fit another models. Um, in this uh, linear AI uh, models, basically we train those two parameters simultaneously. Great, thanks. Probably I will go back to um, part two one. Ahead. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so since I want to preserve some time for scene one to speak his neural source filter models, I will uh, quickly speak this part, um, which is um, non-neural source filter models, um, including um, Kepstam, Bokoda's mixed excitations or straight, which can be represented in mathematical form like this. Here, F is a filter, and E is the excitation signals, and C is a conditional futures. But we should say that this excitation signal E isn't white noise. Sorry, Shima, I cannot. Ah, oh, now good. The reasons why we want to quickly explain this uh, source filter format is, is because um, the parallel WebNet or WebGrow that I mentioned earlier is strange, unnatural or strange in my opinions. <clears throat> if, he, if, if he study speech production physics behind, because um, the parallel WebNet or WebGrowth use the only noise signals to generate speech waveforms. This is handy from engineering point of view, but it's different from physical mechanisms of our speech productions. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so in this short presentation, I try to convince you why um, I why I feel such a noise excitation speech generation is a strange. Um, that's because um, <clears throat> our speech production models 
can be approximated in source filter manners like this. Um, the has two excitation, two type of excitation signals, which is pulse train and the white noise. So probably you have seen this figure um, before because it's quite a famous figure. Um, in the source filter theory, we prepare two type of excitation signals and mix them according to voice and voice informations. <clears throat> then we apply a filters defined by a spectrum envelope to generate synthetic speech. So uh, probably, but you haven't seen why we could derive this format from uh, speech production point of view. So please let me quickly explain why. Why? Uh, in order to do that, I need to define a few uh, symbols, which is uh, frequency F and the wave length L, which has one pitch wave. Uh, F multiply lambda, sorry, lambda. Um, is equals to C, which is uh, speed of sound, 300 meters per second. <clears throat> then um, we now consider fitting the waves into uh, close uh, tubes that has the length of 70, 75 centimeters. The reasons why we consider such a we are length 75 point centimeter is, is because um, this is a average vocal tracks length of humans. <clears throat> um, then if we consider <clears throat> a fundamental so sorry, wave length of a fundamental wave that can be fitted to this close tube is as you could see has the length of 0.7 meters. <clears throat> which is four times the length of the tube. And therefore we could say that uh, resonance of those closed tube is 500 Hertz. We could also compute other resonances that fit to those closed tubes um, in an analytic way. Um, probably you might study those kind of physics when you're high school. <clears throat> the other wavelengths um, that fit it to the, 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 this closed tube has um, three, <clears throat> sorry, uh, one third or one fifth of the, 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 the length of the wavelengths, and therefore uh, their frequencies are uh, 1,500 hertz and 2,000. 500 hertz. <clears throat> In other words, uh, frequency resonance this response of the, the tube is um, those three frequencies that I calculated just now. Of course, um, in this assumptions, meaning using closed tube as a human vocal tracks is to simplify assumptions and therefore in reality we should use um, <clears throat> use more appropriate um, the shape of vocal track and uh, their frequency resonances but um, I just try to explain the derivations of source filter models and um, other excitations we use is um, basically um, <clears throat> uh, sorry, yeah, um, in order to generate um, the sound, we need to have some like a uh, source of the sound energy, uh, which is caused by uh, vibrations or a vocal cords, like a uh, muscles you have around here. Those muscles repeat open and the close, and then those freak like a frequency of all those open and close correspond to a frequency of fundamental frequencies. 
So if you visualize the airflow coming from your um, lug, um, it becomes like this when the <coughs> <clears throat> when the Boca fold is closed, basically um, airflow stops, but when it opens, airflow comes again. Um, it also gradually open, and therefore it's not pulse, it has gradual change like this, like in left figures. So if you visualize those airflow in frequency, it becomes, typically becomes like this, <clears throat> it has F0 as uh, the fundamental components and its harmonics as multiples of F0. So um, source filter theory is basically use those two elements and multiply them as approximations of uh, spectrum of our voice sound. In addition to this, uh, we also need um, another type of um, <coughs> source, which is um, the source for unvoiced sound, where um, vocal folds are not vibrating, and therefore um, airflow are quite random turbulence like this. So in source filter models, basically we did approximations like this. We approximate vocal force to pulse. And the, yeah, turbulence to random noise. <clears throat> and therefore it becomes this format. <clears throat> it has not only um, white noise, but also pulse twin, which contain a fundamental frequency, but also um, harmonic structures that represent glottal spectrum. And those are applied to filters to approximate spectrums. If you have used HMM speed synthesis, and this framework has been used for a long time to generate speech frame form, uh, through Okoda's called MLSA, um, which is name of filters. Um, um, it works like this. It uses um, in standard source filter way, it uses a pulse a white noise and mix those two sources to generate excitation signals. Then those are filtered by uh, male capstan. Um, which is, <clears throat> strictly speaking, we need to apply frequency out warpings to get linear capstan, and then apply uh, inverse FFT, so meaning um, filtering is done in frequency domains. On the other hand, in MLSA filters, uh, we skip those two steps uh, through PADE approximations. Um, we could consider slight variance like uh, mixed excitations where uh, instead of binary selections of pulse twain or white noise, we consider weighted sum of those two excitation signals. Um, probably you might also remember those <coughs> names of vocoders called straight and loud. Um, they are also a type of source filter vocoders, but it has um, some additional tricks to remove audible artifacts. According to their claim, they claim that um, a small change of F0 at each frame causing um, audible artifact. So please remember that spectrum envelope so our spectrum has two components, which is um, envelope, also plus envelope defined by uh, formant or vocal track resonance, a plus uh, fine structures defined by harmonics. So meaning um, if 
f0 s、uh, each frame has different values, slightly different values, the harmonic position slightly c h a n g e as you could see from those red、um, arrows. Then,、um, according to Professor Kawahara, he managed to remove those、um, artifacts due to small change of F0s by applying additional smoothing onto spectra, meaning、um, he applied time frequency smoothing to cancel out such a small movement of harmonics of. STFT spectrum. Then this was suitable for HMM or GNM, GMM. But this is not necessarily the best for DNM because DNM、um, can use raw data.、Um, so we, according to our experiments, the simple STFT spectra is, is sufficient、mm -hmm. to train. The models. <clears throat> okay,、um, so this is the、um, end of my part one sections. And then now I will hand over to Shinwan to explain his neural source filter models. So, in the first part, I think Yamagi Sensei have introduced how the、uh, traditional source filter works. For the neural source filter waveform model, I think the idea is inspired from the classic models. So, as you can see from these equations, we're still using、uh, excitation signals as an input to the model. But the difference is we use a neural network rather than conventional signal processing blocks to convert the excitation into the waveform.、Um, let's show how the model s、um, w o r k s in this picture.、Uh, As I mentioned, so the neural network itself is still、uh, a common network without auto regressive structure, without normalizing flow. So we're just fitting the、uh, condition, uh, condition features. What we want to get is the、uh, waveform samples.、Uh, but of course, the difference is we provide additional excitation signals.、Uh, for this particular model, we're using a sine waveform, as you can see from the picture below.、Um, And、uh, by giving this kind of excitation signal, which the network converted、um, to some kind of、uh, waveform.、Um, by looking at the speech waveform and the sine waveform、uh, in this picture, you can see how、uh, similar they are.、Uh, we have、uh, both periodic structures in the speech waveform, we have、uh, periodic structure in the sine waveform. As long as we can generate a proper、uh, sine waveform with the correct、uh, fundamental frequency or the pure old, Uh, it's highly possible that we can convert this kind of sine waveform into, into a good quality speech waveform. So, this is basically a simple idea of the neural source filter waveform model.、Uh, but let's look at how、uh, we can implement such kind of model. To implement this model, we simply divide the、uh, model into three parts. One part working on the source, one part is the neural network itself, another part to process the condition features. Based on,、uh, based on this idea, we have these three modules for the neural source filter waveform models. Although we have proposed、uh, a few、uh, neural source filter waveform models, The basic framework for all the、uh, neural source filter models can be、uh, shown in this picture. So we have a condition module to process the input features. We have the source module to generate the excitation signal from the fundamental frequency. And then we have the neural filter module to convert the excitation into the output waveform.、Um, notice that. The input acoustic features require F0 because we need to generate the excitation signal that carries the、uh, source information. The output for the、uh, neural source filter waveform model is a float valued waveform. So, this is different from the、uh, WaveNet, which uses the quantized waveform. So, I think this is important to know.、Um, based on this structure,、uh, from now on, I'd like to、uh, briefly explain、uh, each one of its m o d u l a Uh, the first one is the condition module. This is quite simple.、Uh, one purpose of this module is to do op sampling. 
Uh, as I mentioned in the first part of the uh, lecture, we know that the input acoustic features are defined uh, for each frame, but we need to generate waveform for each sampling point. So in this case, uh, one simple way is just to directly upsample the acoustic features by duplicating or repeating each value in, uh, of, of one frame multiple times so that we can get the upsampled uh, features. Of course, we can also uh, use additional LSTM, RN, or convolution layers to change the dimensions or to transform the input filter sli slightly before we fit in uh, to the neural filter module. So this is a simple idea for the condition module. Of course, um, I think uh, many of us may know that uh, there are many ways to do the upsampling, for example, by using the uh, so-called transpose 1D convolution or deconvolution. Um, and you can check this blocks, uh, and uh, I think you can also try it in the hands-on session to try different flavors of a condition module. But for us, the uh, NSM models, we use this simple condition module to process the input acoustic features. Um, Given the input F0s, uh, we, use a sign, uh, we, we use a source module to produce excitation signal. As I mentioned before, it's based on the sign uh, generator, a sign waveform. Uh, to give an idea how it works, um, suppose we're giving an upsampled F0 curve like, show, uh, like, like the picture here. Uh, what we can do is to use the equation to generate the uh, sine waveform. So you can notice uh, there is uh, the periodic part, but also there is the, uh, the noise part. So for the noise part, because we don't have the F0 for those part, uh, like the unvoiced sound, we just use random noise. But for the periodic part, as long as we know the F0, we can use a simple equation to produce a sine waveform that carries the F0. Um, the equation may look uh, slightly complicated. There are so many elements in this equation, such as sampling rate, initial phase, and additive noise. Uh, but you, you don't need to worry about that because uh, actually you can try this equations in the hands-on session. There are uh, one chapter or one notebook for that. Um, by using this equation, we can produce a fundamental frequency, uh, the sine waveform. Uh, we can use similar equations to produce harmonic overtones just by increasing the F0 values. Um, by doing this, we can generate multiple harmonics. After that, we simply use a feed forward layer, as shown here, to merge all the uh, harmonics, uh, the fundamental component and overtones into the final excitation signal. So notice that this feed forward layer uh, is jointly trained with the rest of the network. So it's not uh, uh, it's, it's 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 not fixed. So it's it's not uh, pre uh, pre trained. Um, given the excitation signal, the next uh, module is the neural uh, filter module. So in, for uh, for this initial model, we use multiple filter blocks. Uh, to transform the input excitation into the output waveform. But of course, uh, in this case, it's a neural filter block. Um, showing this picture is the structure of one block. Actually, we use the same architecture for all the blocks in the neural filter module. Um, if you see the picture on the top of this slide, you can, well, you can realize how it is similar to what we used in the, for example, WaveNet and ClariNet. We use dilated convolution. We also use the uh, gated activation function. We also use the alpha transformation to transform the input signal into the output signal. Uh, and of course, we follow the conventions, for example, using a 10 dilated uh, 1D convolution in each block. And it will just repeat the structure for all the uh, filter blocks. So notice that the input to each filter block and the output of each filter block is the same, uh, has the same dimension. It's just one D uh, dimension signal. So the output of the final block will be the um, waveform. And uh, also like to mention is that uh, for each, for the, for, for, for the uh, spectrum features given by the uh, condition module, you can see uh, they are added to the output of the convolution layers before they are fit in to the gated activation function. So this is also the same as uh, what we did, uh, what we do for the WaveNet and uh, ClariNet. Um, okay, so given the output waveform, how can we train the network? We need to define the training criterion. Uh, 
of course, the simple way um, is to just define a mean square error, like what we uh, usually use for all kinds of neural networks uh, for regression tasks. But does it not work? Uh, I think the answer is not. I would play one sound, uh, I would play one audio sample, which was generated by such kind of network. Uh, I don't know whether you hear it. Um, the sound is quite muffled and you cannot uh, cl clearly understand what is being said in the audio. Um, I think there is strong reason for um, the uh, artifact or the shortcoming of this kind of uh, uh, training criterion, but I don't think I, I, I have time to explain it. Um, of course, a better way is to use this kind of spectrum distance. Uh, there are three different points I'd like to mention from the mean square error. The first one is we measure the distance not only per each sampling point, we measure the distance between multiple sampling points in the frame. The second one is we're not, uh, we're not calculating the distance in the time domain, but we're calcula uh, calculating the distance in the spectrum domain. Uh, third point is, uh, as we will show later, this kind of spectrum distance uh, is homogeneous. No matter how we change the configuration we used to calculate spectrum distance, we can always do uh, bar propagation uh, like this. Um, as you can see uh, from the um, blue uh, uh, curves or the, the blue uh, arrows, uh, so the gradient can be calculated after we calculate the spectrum distance and the way you can use this gradient to train the network just using a uh, standard band propagation and gradient descent. So this is how uh, the, training, uh, the training criterion is defined for, for the neural source filter model. Uh, of course, in implementation, we can leverage the short time Fourier transform because uh, we can do this quickly. And uh, we can also use inverse, S, uh, inverse uh, short time Fourier transform to calculate the gradient. I think nowadays everybody uses PyTorch or TensorFlow, uh, you may not care about this, but uh, as long as you are dealing with a CUDA uh, where you have to implement the bar propagation by hand, then you have to care about the, uh, the way to calculate the gradients. But this is how we do it in our implementation uh, by using the short time Fourier transform and the inverse transform. As I mentioned in the uh, previous, previous slide, the short time Fourier transform is homogeneous, which means when we calculate the distance between the natural and generous waveform, we can use different configurations uh, to, uh, for, for the STFT. For example, uh, we may change the uh, time, uh, the, the, the frame length, we may change the window type, we may change the number of F FFT points we used. But no matter what kind of configuration we use, uh, the point is we can directly sum the uh, distance together and we can directly calculate the gradients by summing the gradients from each configuration, uh, as you can see from this figure. And uh, this criterion is quite important if we remove, if we just use only one single uh, STFT uh, transform, you will get the artifact. And uh, such kind of so-called a multi-resolution training criterion has also been used by many other papers uh, I will show later. But this is how we train the network using the multi-resolution STFT criterion. So up to now, I have uh, briefly shown how we can implement the neural source filter waveform model, uh, but uh, you may still wonder how it works. So in this, uh, from this slide, I will play um, I will extract the audios from inside of the network and I will play it and show the spectrogram and you will see how the network gradually changes the uh, input excitation into the output waveform. So here is the excitation signal. Pierre obeys me when we are together. 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 I think from uh, this demonstration, you can see how the input excitation, which only contains the fundamental frequency or pitch information, is gradually changed by the filter block into the output waveform. 
uh, although the picture I shown uh, here shows a spectrogram, but remember that all the operations are done in the time domain. We directly generate waveform. So you can notice how the filters, neural filters, can add the details to the spectrogram or to the frequency domain of the waveform. And our final output will be uh, the speech waveform of, of the target speaker. Um, so another interesting uh, demonstration I'd like to show is here. So suppose we have trained the network. Uh, we fit in the input acoustic features such as the mirror spectrogram and also F0. So what will happen if we change the F0 input? So remember in the old days, for example, when, when we are using a straight, once we change the F0, the output waveform will also change accordingly. That's one advantage of the traditional source filter waveform model and the straight vocoder. But whether we can do this on neural source filter waveform models and the WaveNet. So I'd like to play the samples first original F0, and then we uh, increase F0 by uh, just multiply it with a factor two or decrease it, and finally filling uh, the, the uh, zero F0. I will play the sound. He was manifestly distressed by my coming. 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 So from the samples of a male voice, you can um, probably perceive um, while the F0, the pitch in the general waveform from the NS model changes, but for the WaveNet, it does not seem to change a lot. Even if we fit in zero F0, the uh, output speech seems to have the same uh, uh, pitch as the original case. Um, here, I'd like to play one more uh, case for the female speaker. He was manifestly distressed by my coming. 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 So from these samples, you can uh, probably um, have uh, impression how uh, the different, how different these two types of architectures, uh, I mean NSF and WaveNet, can be. And of course, there are many questions we can ask uh, based on these uh, demonstrations. Um, but let's uh, first move on to the next slide. Yes, about the generation speed, uh, this may not be uh, so interesting because, as you can imagine, since the NSM model uh, does not use autoregressive uh, or the inverse AR flow. So the generation speed uh, could be much faster than the wave uh, So this is expected. Uh, but here I just like to mention that if uh, somebody ha happened to use an NSM model uh, before 2020, or if you see the paper from our ICASP, uh, we have a memory uh, saving mode for the NSF where we dynamically uh, allocate GPU memories. Uh, in the original implementation, the speed for that one was quite slow. But uh, since the beginning of this year, we have implemented a faster version for the memory saving mode so that we can generate a long waveform with less than one gigabytes of the GPU memories and the speed is still fast. Uh, this is a simple thing I want to mention from this figure, but uh, uh, probably it's not interesting because uh, as long as we are using the non auto regressive model, the speed can be fast. Okay, um, up to this point, I have uh, briefly explained uh, the basic idea of the uh, the original uh, neural source filter waveform model. So after that, we did a lot of uh, improvement or uh, change to the original model. Uh, for example, as shown here, uh, we may use additional excitation signals. We may uh, improve the model to cover uh, reverb uh, effect in the uh, audio data. So this is what we did for the improved uh, neural source filter waveform model. 
to give you a brief review about the improvement. So as you can see from, from, this, speaker, uh, from this picture, in the original WaveNet, we're using a single source, one single stream of neural filter uh, to produce the speech waveform. But we know that a speech waveform has uh, not only the periodic component, but also non-periodic uh, component. So in order to um, make the uh, Anderson model more, uh, more suitable for speech, we borrowed the idea from the harmonic plus noise structure. Uh, we derived two uh, different types of models here, always fixed band for the harmonic and uh, plus noise. Uh, another one is the time variant band. Uh, I will show the details later, but this is one uh, point we, we, we'd like to uh, mention. Uh, second one is, uh, although we are using the sine uh, as excitation, uh, the question is whether a sine waveform is the best for speech production. For uh, To improve this point, we, we introduce a cyclic noise excitation, as I will show later in this uh, part of lecture. Uh, finally, I'd, I'd, I'd like to also mention that we also simplify the neural filter block. Uh, I think I will not explain the details here. You can find the slide in the appendix. Okay, um, for the first part, um, we introduce the, uh, we, we incorporate the harmonic plus noise structure to the neural source filter waveform models, as you can see from this picture. Uh, for this model, we not only have one source, but we also use another noise source. We not only use single stream of filters, but we're also using two streams. Um, so the top stream which, uh, will receive the noise excitation and produce some kind of waveform. So after we produce the waveforms, we will sum them together through the conventional low pass and high pass filters. Then output will be the final uh, waveform. Uh, here is one example how it works. So this is the uh, spectrogram of the uh, waveform generated by the two branches. The upper one is generated from the noise signal and the bottom one is generated from psi excitation. So you can see the harmonic structures in the uh, spectrogram at the bottom. Uh, giving the input uh, uh, waveform, uh, we just pass, it, uh, pass them through the high pass and low pass filters to remove the frequencies. For example, in the high frequency region for the uh, lower, uh, for the signal at the bottom, to remove the low frequency for the signal at, uh, at the top. After that, we can directly sum them together to get, a, uh, to get the output. So this is how it works. I'd like to mention that although I show spectrogram here, um, all the waveforms are generated in the time domain. So we don't directly generate spectrogram. Uh, spectrogram. This is only plotted for visualization. Um, yes, um, somebody may wonder how can we incorporate the uh, conventional digital filters with the neural networks, whether we can train the network uh, through backpropagation. The answer is yes. So to give uh, you one example how it works, for example, once we get the gradient from uh, uh, with respect to the output waveform, we can directly propagate the gradient back to the network through the uh, digital filters. This is how it was done when we trained the network as a whole. Um, of course, you may wonder how it works. So let, let, let me uh, briefly explain how it works. So in this case, we're using the finite impulse response, uh, the so-called FIR digital filters. Uh, you can see the equations uh, on the left, uh, on the right side of slow, uh, slide. Uh, so when we calculate the output waveform, we just use this kind of weighted sum. The H here denotes the coefficients of the filters. Uh, one example showing here is, uh, for example, if we want to uh, calculate the output value of Y, we can use the input value Xn, Xn minus one, Xn minus two, and then we do, uh, we do a weighted sum. So as you can see from this picture, the uh, FIR digital filter is quite similar to the 1D convolution layers. Uh, so as we can imagine, we can also do propagation through the digital filter, just like what we did or what we do for the 1D convolution layers, uh, as you can see from this picture. Once we get the gradients uh, with, with respect to the output waveform, then we do the uh, so-called uh, transposed 1D convolution, and then we can collect the gradients. 
uh, re, uh, re, re, with respect to the input. So this is how we can do back propagation through the digital filters uh, in the neural network. Um, okay. This is a picture I shown before. Uh, you may notice that when we do the filtering, the bad pulse or the, the cutoff frequency of the filter is fixed. For example, in this case, we remove the uh, certain frequencies from the harmonic component um, and we change the frequency only in the voice region. So uh, as you can see from the black lines. Uh, but of course, this filter are, are fixed when we train the network, we first give the filter coefficients to the network, and then we just let the network um, to propagate the gradient and train the network as a whole. Um, of course, since we're, uh, since we're using neural network, one idea is how can we change this kind of behavior? How can we predict the uh, cutoff frequency or so-called maximum voiced frequency? The idea is like this we uh, add additional block in the condition module to predict the cutoff frequency or the maximum voiced frequency from the input acoustic features. So giving the uh, predicted acoustic, uh, the, giving the predicted uh, the cutoff frequency, we can change the uh, coefficients of the filters. So in this case, in order to do that, we parameterize the filters as windowed sync filter. Um, I think uh, not everybody may be familiar with these kind of signal processing uh, topics, but here I just show one uh, example, how can we do that? So suppose we're giving one uh, number of the cutoff frequency, we can just simply generate a sync function. After that, we multiply it with the Hamming window. Finally, we do some kind of gain normalization and the output from the final part will be the filter coefficients we used. Uh, or you can imagine as a weight of the uh, 1D convolution layers if we consider the digital filters as 1D convolution layer. Of course, this process is also uh, differentiable. We can propagate the gradients back and we can use this gradient to train the condition module. So this is how we done for the filters. So in this case, the low pass filter. Uh, we have similar procedure for the high pass filter uh, and we prepared hands-on uh, materials so that you can see how exactly we implement this in PyTorch or Python code. Um, here is one example uh, of uh, what will happen if we change the input cutoff frequency. So on the left column is the filter coefficients in the time domain. And on the right column is the uh, frequency response of the filters. As you can see from the black, the red, and the blue lines, once we increase the cutoff frequency, the filter also, the cutoff frequency of the filter also changes. So this is how we manage to uh, parameterize the cutoff frequency as the filters and how can we accordingly change the behavior of the filter based on the input cutoff frequency. Again, you can see uh, this example in the hands-on session. Um, so given this kind of implementation, we can finally get this kind of behavior from the network. Uh, as you can see from this picture, the black lines in the spectrogram denotes the predicted cutoff frequency from the acoustic features. As you can see, it's not fixed in the voice region or unvoiced region. It gradually changes as the acoustic feature changes. So this is what we expected. We want to uh, make everything trainable. Um, so this idea for the windowed sync filter, um, up to now we have, uh, no matter whether it's a harmonic structure, a harmonic plus noise structure or the predicted uh, cutoff frequency, they are about the uh, source filter, uh, they're about the filter part of the neural source filter waveform model. The next question is, um, how can we improve the source part? As I mentioned in the previous part of, the lex of this lecture, we're using a sine waveform as the excitation. But we know that sine may not be appropriate because in speech, not every sound is purely uh, periodic. Not every sound is purely random. So here are some uh, samples for different types of uh, articulation when we pr uh, pronounce a sound. The modal sound, the bracy sound, the facetal sound, the creaky sound. 
So A is the waveform and B is the residual from the LP, uh, uh, LPC LRIs. So from this picture, I think uh, when we, have, we, we can have this uh, kind of impression that not all kinds of sound will look like sine waveform. So sometimes the waveform can be quite noisy. Sometimes it, it do, some, uh, do have some kind of pulse string like uh, shape. So to deal with these different types of waveform shape, or the speech waveform shape, we may need to use a more appropriate uh, excitation signal. That's the motivation to use the cyclic noise. Um, here from this picture, you can see how it implements the cyclic uh, noise excitation. Um, the equation may look complicated, but uh, just let me show how we do it with examples. So the first step is to generate the uh, Gaussian noise, as you can see from the picture, uh, the black uh, line here. After that, we fit in the beta uh, parameter and, uh, and, and use the exponential decaying function to change the shape of the uh, noise. So the output will be uh, the blue curve, as you can see from this picture below. So uh, the, the amplitude of the noise is gradually decreasing along the time. Meanwhile, we can generate a pulse train based on the input F0, uh, as you can see from this picture. After that, we can do a simple convolution. So this is a convolution in the conventional sense. Um, as you can see feature, we just uh, convolute the pulse train with the decaying noise so that we can get the final output as shown in the uh, picture. So, for this, from this picture, you can realize why it is called cyclic noise, because it's noise, uh, uh, it, it's, it's noise sequence in a short time span. But when we look at the waveform from the whole time span, we can see the noise is, is repeated according to the fundamental frequency of the input futures. And uh, from this picture, you can also see there is a parameter called beta, which is controlled how fast we decrease the um, uh, noise in each epoch or in, in each local uh, time span. Of course, we can change the parameter of the beta like this. So if we decrease a beta parameter, uh, the noise decreases faster and uh, the excitation would be more closer to the pulse string like excitation. Of course, we can also increase the beta parameter. In this case, the output will be more noisy. Um, so this is how we can use this beta parameter to, to change the behavior of excitation. Of course, uh, when we train the network, we can use the beta parameter as hyperparameter. We just fix the value and let the network uh, use this kind of a, a cyclic noise to produce output waveform. But of course, since we are using a neural network, the question is whether we can predict this beta parameter from the input acoustic features. And again, the answer is yes we can simply add another block in the condition module to predict the uh, beta parameter from the acoustic features. And then we can fit in to the decay uh, module to change the uh, shape of the noise. The good thing is this kind of network is still uh, differentiable. We can calculate the gradient with, with respect to the beta parameter and use this gradient to train the condition module. This is how we train the um, whole network using bar propagation. So although they're based on signal processing ideas, but we can implement it in the neural network and, and we can train the network using the conventional uh, bar propagation and the uh, stochastic uh, gradient descent. Okay, uh, having explained so many variants of the neural source filter waveform models, here, I'd like to play some samples so you can have an idea how it sounds for different speakers. So I will play from natural to the bottom, um, from left to right. He was manifestly distressed by my coming. 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 No female speakers. He was manifestly distressed by my coming. 
He was manifestly distressed by my coming. He was manifestly distressed by my coming. He was manifestly distressed by my coming. He was manifestly distressed by my coming. If you want to listen to more samples, you can visit our website on the GitHub. But at least I hope you can perceive the difference, especially when we switch from the single excitation to the harmonic noise plus noise structure. So especially on the envoy sound, how the model can uh, reduce the bossy sound in the envoy region of the uh, of the sample for the baseline and set models. So. Up to now, I have explained how we can improve the answer models to, uh, to, to better model the speech waveform. But for other kinds of applications, we can also uh, combine the answer model with other signal processing ideas. So one example is the reverberation modeling. As we know that when, uh, especially for uh, people are using text-to-speech data of corpus, I mean, the speech quality is quite high because we're recording the speech data in a good environment. However, when we deploy the model in the uh, user environment, when users use cell phones or other digital devices, um, the, the acoustic condition may be so bad. For example, one problem is the reverberation, um, which means the sound will uh, reflect or deflect it in the room and will reach the, um, will reach the ear of the receiver or will reach the microphone, uh, which resolves this, this kind of uh, complicated impulse response uh, of this room. Um, my idea is how can we deal with this kind of re reverberation effect? Of course, uh, one simple idea is suppose the input features contain this kind of uh, reverberation uh, information. Then we can add um, some layers in the condition module to predict the room impulse response that represents the reverberation of the room. So after that, we can see, use similar ideas to what we have seen in the uh, conventional vocoders, uh, just by convert the input uh, to, uh, just to com uh, convert the output waveform from the original SF um, to the reverb waveform so that we can simulate the reverberation effect in the room. Um, it might be hard to uh, explain how it works, but uh, let me just quickly show some examples. So first is natural uh, speech with room reverberation. Ask her to bring these things with her from the store. And then it's a dry waveform without, I mean, before we add in the re a reverb effect. Ask her to bring these things with her from the store. And then after we add the reverb effect. Ask her to bring these things with her from the store. Of course, the quality is uh, slightly limited because of the uh, noisy and reverb audio data in the training set. But at least you can perceive how uh, the, the, the reverb effect is added to the output waveform once we add this kind of module. Here's one other example for the female speaker. Six spoons of fresh snow peas, five thick slabs of blue cheese, and maybe a snack of her brother Bob. Six spoons of fresh snow peas, five thick slabs of blue cheese, and maybe a snack of her brother Bob. Six spoons of fresh snow peas, five thick slabs of blue cheese, and maybe a snack of her brother Bob. Yes. That's a simple idea about the reverberation part. Okay, to um, briefly summarize what we have covered in this part. We first introduced a baseline NSF model, which was inspired by the idea of conventional source filter waveform modeling approach. After that, for the uh, speech waveform modeling, we introduced the harmonic plus noise uh, structure. Meanwhile, uh, we introduced the cyclic noise uh, excitation to improve the quality of the speech waveform, uh, especially with, with respect to different ways of articulation. Uh, of course, there are different kinds of uh, improvement. Uh, these are original. Uh, well, these are basically uh, application or oriented. For example, we can use uh, add the reverb effect to deal with the room reverb reverberation effect. We can also adopt the uh, baseline answer model for music applications. So this is one I'd like to mention in the later part of this lecture.
But uh, to briefly summarize what we can get from these NSA models, I think uh, one strong point about the NSA model is the flexibility. Because we can plug in so many different types of uh, signal or speech processing algorithms, and we can do the buffer propagation in the neural network. But the limitation is that this NSA model is not um, as strong as other kind of probabilistic models for waveform modeling. You can see, find the details uh, in the appendix. I cannot, uh, I cannot explain it here. But this is one reason why sometimes, uh, if, even if we add more data, the quality from the ISM model may not be compatible, uh, may not be competitive uh, to other uh, AR models. But of course, the uh, question is whether the long autoregressive model or the flow, uh, long autoregressive or non-flow model is doomed, whether we can only generate this kind of qualities uh, from the uh, NSM models or related models. Well, the answer is not. So this is a reason for the next part, the GAN-based approach. Uh, as I mentioned by the Amgish uh, Sensei in the previous uh, uh, part of this lecture, for this kind of uh, gun-based approach, they are also using white noise as excitation. So this is against how we understand the speech production process of human beings. But actually, they work. Here, um, yes, as I mentioned before, for the neural source filter waveform models, we're using the sine waveform, or we're using the periodic uh, noise as excitation. So what will happen if we directly use the white noise as the excitation to the non-ARR or the non-flow-based approach? Here, I'd like to play one sound. He was manifestly distressed by my coming. This is the same sound as I played before, where we uh, set the F0 to uh, 0. So as you can see, uh, as you can hear from the sample, the speech is somewhat intelligible, but the quality is, uh, I mean, the sound seems to be harsh. It does not sound like a human speech. Um, of course, this is against um, the uh, speech production theory about uh, from the uh, conventional literature. But as, uh, as, as we see from recent uh, work, as long as we are using better networks or different types of networks, such as uh, the, the general adversarial network, can do some kind of uh, speech production from the white noise. So one example is the Powler Wavegun, uh, which I think was, was not mentioned yesterday. For this kind of network, it's very similar to the uh, NSM model. It still uses this kind of dilated convolution to convert the input uh, into the generated waveform. It also uses this multi-resolution spectrum distance to, uh, as one part of the training criterion. But one difference is here. Instead of only using the uh, short-time Fourier transform distance, the parallel wave gun also adds the uh, discriminator of the gun-based approach to judge whether the generative waveform is, uh, is real or fake. And then they can train the network as a whole. Uh, from the audios in the paper, uh, at least I can see um, the quality is quite high. Uh, it's, it proves that we can generate a speech waveform from the random noise, as long as we, uh, we are using different types of network, rather than the simple um, non-autoregressive or non-flow-based uh, networks. The second example is Amerigan, which was covered in uh, the lecture yesterday. But here I'd like to mention one point, I think which is not mentioned in, uh, in, in the lecture yesterday. So in this kind of Merigan, one interesting about the, uh, the discriminator is that they not only uh, use one discriminator, but use multiple discriminators. What's more, the input to each discriminator might not necessarily uh, be the original waveform. As you can see from this, uh, from this figure, uh, for the mirror gun, they also use downsampled waveform as input to the discriminator. I think this could be useful because once we do the downsampling, what we can see in the spectral domain would be different from the original waveform. So this might give different resolutions or different evidence for the, uh, for the discriminator to judge whether the general waveform is, uh, can be differentiated from the natural waveform or not.
So I think this is one in interesting point about the way, uh, but, uh, about the uh, Merigan approach. Okay, uh, again, <laughs> why do this kind of approach works, uh, although they're against the speech production theory? I think one important thing uh, we need to notice uh, is this. So this is a picture what Yamaguchi uh, Sensei have shown at the beginning of this lecture, where we derive the mere spectrogram from the input uh, spectrogram. As you can see, most of the work using mirror spectrogram as an input, but for this kind of uh, acoustic feature, they actually contains the F0 information, as you can see from the feature uh, on the left side of the, uh, uh, of the figure. This is harmonic structure, uh, which exactly contains F0 information. So in other words, what the, this kind of gun-based approach does, I think, can be interpreted in this way. So although they don't explicitly provide excitation signal to the model. The model can learn this kind of excitation signal from the input acoustic features. So I think this could be uh, one explanation why the gun-based approach can produce the uh, speech waveform from the random noise. Uh, of course, the, the, there is an open question here whether we can build a neural, uh, source, um, a neural overcoders without using the excitation signals completely. But I don't think I have idea about this question and uh, it's an open, I mean, it's quite an open question and we can discuss later. But this is part for the non-autoaggressive and non-flow-based uh, approaches. I think the next part is the uh, glottal vocoder part. Thank you very much. So um, since um, I want to keep some time for music processing, so I will quickly explain this part, and then I will hand um, back to scene one soon. Right, so, so far we have seen um, <clears throat> neural autoregressive models, sorry, autoregressive models and the source filter models. <clears throat> Another type of vocoders it's, which you may study is, 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 is glottal vocoder families where uh, basically we combine um, autoregressive models with another uh, parameterized glottal models, E, as you could see from figures. In previous AR models, we use uh, the GDL signal E, but E is now are parameterized by another functions. So before we go to neural uh, glottal models, I will quickly explain nonlinear ones um, because it also has long histories. Um, so first of all, why do we want to use such a um, parameterized excitation functions? Um, answer is simple, um, as Simon already explained. Excitation signal is not simple pulse or it's not simple noise, it's complex functions. Also, uh, sometimes we wish to control voice qualities like pressy voice, creaky voice, and tense voices. And this is especially important in singing, for instance. <clears throat> so there are a bunch of research. How can we define good and um, controllable functions for E, for excitation functions E. The one of the famous function is LF models. Um, the idea is, is to basically fit um, and the models glottal flow um, better than um, simple pulse. So if we um, compute um, simple derivative of those growth of flow, um, we could get um, those kind of shape, as you can see at the bottom in the left part. So LF models basically assume um, a shape of approximation, a shape of excitation signals like this, which is um, represented by each six parameters. Um, out of six parameters, two of them are not free parameters. So in 
in the other applications, we need to estimate and model four parameters. The later on, um, the researchers also propose a further simplified ILF model that so has two parameters only. Another well-known uh, Grotau models, Grotau functions, is um, iterative, adaptive, and inverse filterings, where we fit another set of LPC for Grotau spectrum. So instead of assuming um, spect special shape of Grotau flow in time domain, we may consider to estimate um, LPC like questions, but low order um, AR models for um, modeling and controlling Grotau spectrum envelope. Since I, we start to run out of time, I will skip how to explain those Grotau spectrum D, um, but you could defer to a part of those nice papers to estimate those. Um, the part three two, part three two is on neural growth models. Um, as you could easily imagine, uh, we could replace such a non-neural non growth of functions to neural ones, uh, which include growth of DNN, growth net, and the group. Um, this also um, overlap with um, LPC net tomorrow. <clears throat> so idea is to replace uh, Grotau functions E to neural ones. Um, why we want to use um, the Grotau waveform instead of acoustic waveform? Um, I already mentioned several reasons, but I want to mention one more reason, which is um, the Grotta waveform is much simpler than acoustic waveform, and therefore it's easier to train if we apply LPC analysis and compute the GDLs. The GDL waveform actually much simpler, but yeah, less complex than acoustic waveform, and therefore it's easier to train, easier to train um, neural network. That's and other motivations to use neural growth models. So we compute the GDLs and train the models. Then we infer growth waveforms and then uh, generate original waveform back to LPC synthesis. Um, the AR linear AR models, which we explain part two to be, or I, so maybe I, <laughs> I forget the name of part, <laughs> but and that also part of a uh, um, similar to Grotau models, but um, the more proper Grotau Bokoda was proposed by Parvo's group. Um, the first one's called Grotau DNN, use um, a V4 or other type of a DNN to models Grotau functions. For conditional futures, um, they use um, spectrum envelope, which can be derived from those A parameters, a plus fundamental frequency, and so on. <clears throat> the growth net ones, uh, on the other hand, use uh, autoregressive models similar to WebNet. So instead of acoustic waveform, they fit WebNet-like architectures to Grotau residuals, so Grotau waveforms. So meaning um, this Grotau waveforms, gro sorry, Grotau net use a path waveform sample of Grotau waveforms to predict next waveform point. Um, I think the concept of LPC net from Google or Excite net from Microsoft also similar to this, in my understanding. Um, then further detail will be given tomorrow. What I want to mention in the end, uh, in the last part of this section, is uh, GELP Bokodas, which is um, quite similar to parallel webgun, or um, in many sense, because it used non-autoregressive 
models. It doesn't have any auto regressive dependency.、Um, it also has、um, multi solutions STFT loss and discriminators to train these models. But it first、um, applied、um, AR modeling s to compute legitials. Then those、uh, legitial excitation signals are estimated from、uh, latent value Z. So, in other words,、um, this is end to end models,、um, quite efficient,、uh, also easy to train because、uh, we remove、um, like a you know, spectrum envelope through AR ones, and therefore, this legitial. Signal or excitation signal is easier to train. <clears throat> so,、um, this is the summary of many vocoders or many <laughs> jargons we talk today.、Um, in our opinion, there are four categories、uh, neural autoregressive family, flow based family. Um, a combination of linear AR and、uh, glottal models, and then non auto regressive and non flow models. So, AR ones include WebNet, WebNN, and Amazon's Universal Neural Vocoders, or Adobe's FFTNet. Flow models include DeepMind's Py WebNet, NVIDIA's WebGrow, Baidu's CryNet. Um, by another vocoder from、um, Baidu called Wayflow.、Um, yeah, I already explained those g r o t h of family, which includes、um, LPC net, g r o t h net. Non auto regressive and non flow models h a s actually two types. So one of them u s e excitation information explicitly, including NSF. Our vocoders,、um, also similar vocoders called HiNet, which use NSF for phase、uh, modeling.、Um, I will stop speaking about this.、Um, another type of models in this family is the GAN、um, based models, where excitation signal is in, implicitly used.、Um, the Pi WebGAN. Melgram, and、um, also the new ones called Hi Fi Gun from Adobe, which、um, basically combines the concept of the parallel web gun and the Melgram for us. Okay, so I understand the our lecture time becomes um, <laughs> um, only three hours, but、um, I want I want to quickly speak about musical processing. Yes.、Um, so, compared with the、uh, lengthy lecture about the、uh, speech part, I think the music part could be more、Oops. interesting. Yeah,、oh, it's okay.、Uh, I'll just click the play. Okay. So, the music part, I think, would be interesting.、Um, As you can see,、uh, read from the news in the recent years, there are so many big companies working on the music generation. For example, the Google Agenda,、uh, the OpenAI、uh, work.、Um, yes, this is kind of a fancy topic, but I'd like to mention also that for music、uh, information processing, there are actually so many different kinds of、uh, subtasks, and you can find these、uh, topics in the reference. Um, for this part, I only focus on the music, music instrument audio generation. So, the task would be quite similar to what we need to face for the、um, speech waveform generation. So, due to the similarity, let's, let's, let, let me introduce the、uh, music audio generation by comparing it with the speech uh, co uh, counterpart.、Um, in terms of applications, Uh, as you know, we, have,、uh, we can use the, the vocoders、uh, in the TTS model to generate waveform from acoustic features. There is a similar application in the music wave, waveform generation, as shown in this picture.
we can fit in some kind of piano roll which specifies note, the, the, the strength to hit the key, and then we can uh, use acoustic model to generate acoustic features and use the uh, something like a vocoder to produce the waveform uh, for, the, for the music. So this is one kind of uh, similarity uh, in terms of equation uh, to convert the symbolic values into the waveform. Uh, of course, there is uh, because the piano roll is quite uh, simple compared with the text. So I think there are so uh, there are also applications which directly convert the piano roll into the waveform. But I think this is also idea similar to what the original WaveNet paper uh, is talking about, just to convert the symbolic values into the waveform. So these are some kind of similar applications. But of also, but of course, we can give further examples like the verse conversion where we uh, fit in one waveform we want to change the uh, speaker identity in the waveform in case of the music audio generation this task is uh, usually called the timber uh, conversion or the timber interpolation uh, the approach is slightly different uh, as you can see from this picture they use different encoders to extract the latent features then after that, they do the interpolation in a Latin space so that they can generate a music waveform that sounds like uh, in between of the waveform one, the instrument one, or instrument two. Or they can create a new instrument by interpolating between the two instruments. Um, so this is the similarity of the uh, speech generation or audio generation in terms of, uh, of, of the application. As you can see from the right part of this figure, we can use the vocoder as, uh, to generate a waveform. But of course, the question is whether we can do this to, to, to use a similar vocoders that can be used for speech and uh, music waveform generation. I think uh, the answer is some kind of positive because uh, from the point of uh, uh, physics, I mean, uh, source filter models can be somehow applied to music waveform generation. So let's give one example. This, this is a picture which uh, you have seen in the previous part of this lecture. For the human speaker, we have the sound source, we have a vocal, vocal track to modulate the uh, excitation into the speech waveform. And we can actually uh, draw uh, similar figures for some kind of, uh, some part of the uh, instrument families, for example, for the clarinet. The mouse kit can be regarded as a source which produce some kind of air uh, flow into the tube, and then the tube will modulate this uh, air flow into the output um, waveform. So this is one case uh, where we can, maybe we can apply the source filter. But remember, there are so many different types of instrument we have. So this is for the uh, woodwind instrument. So how about the uh, string family of the instrument? Uh, so in this case, we can think of the bow and the string and the source and the chamber of the violin and the filter. Um, but this is one ideal case, but how about the last case where we use a xylophone for, um, <laughs> we, we analyze the xylophone. So in this case, what is the filter? What is the uh, source? Um, it's hard to it's hard to explain uh, by using the uh, conventional approaches uh, from the speech production theory, um, but at least from this figure we can understand how uh, different um, the different kinds of instruments can be in terms of the uh, waveform production mechanism. Due to the um, similarity, also the difference in terms of the waveform production uh, mechanism we can see some kind of similarity and the difference in the waveform, especially uh, from the, uh, in the spectral domain. So in the first row, you can see the spectrogram for four speakers. And then in the second row, you can see the spectrogram for the waveform from four types of uh, instrument. I think we can see both some kind of a periodic or harmonic structures in two types of uh, waveforms. Um, but of, of course, we can also see the difference. For example, whether we have consonants for the music. Uh, <laughs> this is quite interesting to ask. Uh, at least this is one difference we can observe by comparing two rows of, of the spectrogram. 
Um, of course, even within the uh, instrument, we can see the difference. Um, for example, uh, you can see from the, uh, the, the horn, the clarinet, the violin, the harmonic range of the, uh, of the sound is completely different. This is due to the, um, well, physic property of the uh, instrument. But there is also other issue, which is called the uh, polyphonic or monophonic uh, property of, of the note or the sound in, uh, by, by the uh, instrument, for example, by the piano or the violin. So this is fundamentally different from the speech where we normally can only use one source. We are only monophonic, but it's not the case for the instrument. So by showing these similarity and differences, we can see uh, the possibility of using the speech vocoders for waveform generation. But we should also see that the quality may be limited if we just directly use what we had for the speed generation. Um, based on this um, idea, uh, I think many people, uh, especially in the big companies, have tried to use uh, neural vocoders uh, for the speech waveform generation. For example, uh, we can use a WaveNet, uh, also um, the WaveRN for music generation. Uh, we can use the neural source filter waveform model and the related model called a differentiable DSP model, a DDSP. And also we can use the GAN-based approach for, for waveform generation. So this is quite interesting um, how the data-driven approach can handle the difference between the speech waveform and music waveform. Um, here, I'd like to give some uh, case studies, uh, maybe one by one, to just briefly introduce how we can use this kind of um, vocoders for music generation. The first uh, case is the WaveNet. So this is a paper by Google uh, where they uh, de derive this kind of encoding and, uh, uh, and decoding uh, structures um, for the waveform generation. Of course, the application for this work is mainly to create a new instrument. So suppose we are giving uh, one instrument, for example, the bass, the flute. Uh, after we apply the encoder, we can interpolate the Latin features and then use the WaveNet to generate waveform. So if you listen to the samples on the website, you can notice how the sound changes uh, when we gradually change the interpolation weight. So I think this is one strong point when we use uh, the neural vocoders for waveform generation. This also creates new application uh, and devices like these. So this is in this device, I think uh, if you point the finger in the screen, uh, you're like, if, you, if you're moving your fingers, it's just like you're moving in the manifold of Latin space. So by pointing to different uh, places in the screen on the device, then you can generate sound with different timber. So I think this is one interesting application, which I think we haven't tried for speech uh, generation. But this is, this is good for music because we always want something different from what we have in the data. So this is for the first application. For the second application, uh, the WaveNet can also be used in the so-called wave to MIDI and MIDI to wave. So for this kind of network, you can consider it as the counterpart um, between the uh, speech dialogue processing system. Uh, the first part will be the music transcription like the ASR system. We convert the audio into the symbols, into the note. So after that, they have this kind of music language model to um, describe the, um, uh, the, the, the music language model. Uh, finally, they can use the uh, piano roll, as you can use the WaveNet to generate the waveform from the piano roll. So this is kind of simple uh, idea, but actually have quite uh, new applications in terms of music generation. So as you can see from this figure, uh, one application is to generate mu music in a coherent way. So once they try the network in the part two, the language model, so-called a music transformer, they can generate a new piano roll from the transformer without any condition, and then they can produce waveform. Another way is giving a primer or some kind of a condition 
the language model can produce a piano roll, uh, which is consistent in terms of style uh, or other kinds of uh, uh, aspects of the music uh, with the primer um, condition, and then they can produce waveform. So this is kind of application, I think, which is uh, interesting. We never think about uh, a talking head, which is uh, talking forever, but people do appreciate if we have some kind of machine that can generate beautiful music forever. So I think this is one int interesting application for the WaveNet. For the third case study, it's, uh, they are using the WaveGun um, uh, for waveform generation. But I think uh, the message we can learn from this paper is slightly different from the first two cases. The message from this paper is that it's, re it's quite difficult to generate a uh, good quality uh, of the music waveform from the GAN-based models. Instead, they have to use traditional approaches to generate the spectra amplitude and the phase in order to create the waveform. Uh, at least from this work, I think uh, we can get the message. If we want to use a GAN, we have to think about something different instead of directly generate the waveform in the time domain. So this is the reason I, I'd like to mention the Gansens uh, in this place. But of course, the final case would be the neural source filter waveform model. Uh, the motivation to use a neural source filter waveform model for music generation is uh, quite related to what we can observe from the music waveform. So here, one example from the piano sound uh, of different note. As you can see from the uh, picture on the right side, the piano sound is quite periodic and it can be approximated by the sine waveform. So this might be good news uh, because uh, you know the answer model uses the sine waveform as, as, as an excitation. So what will happen if we directly use this network to generate some music waveform uh, using sine excitation and using one stream of the neural filter? Um, for this, uh, we did a lot of experiments using um, uh, to train the models, uh, to train an instrument independent uh, as a model. Uh, and we also tried different coppers, but for this experiment, we're using a multi-instrument um, data coppers called URMP. Um, this is quite different from what they used for the NSENSE or the MIDI to uh, wave, wave to MIDI work. But the, just to give an idea about how it works. In the experiment, we uh, tried three different scenarios. One is whether we can train the model from scratch on the music data, although it's quite small, five hours. The second approach is once we're trying a speech waveform model, I mean the NSM model on the speech data, whether we can directly use it to generate waveform, giving the acoustic features of the waveform. And the final one is to fine tune the speech waveform model to the waveform domain. Here is the uh, most score in terms of the quality of a generalist instrument. You can see from different rows corresponding to different instrument. Uh, and there are, we also compare different models, WaveNet, WaveGlow. But here I'd like to mention one uh, result. If we compare the training from scratch results and the zero short learning results, we can see how different the results is. If we directly use a speech model to generate waveform, it does not work. Instead, we have to train, we have to use the music data in order to train the model. But of course, there is similarity between the music and the speech waveform. So that's why if we fine tune the model on the music data, we can get a better performance like this. Uh, sometimes the quality could be better than the natural voice, uh, than the natural audio in the, uh, in the database. Um, here, I'd like to play some samples from this work. Uh, the first sound will be natural one, and then will be the generated sound from the answer model. <laughs> different instrument.
So from these samples, you may perceive how the quality is quite close to the natural sound, although of course there are artifacts in the sound. But at least we see the potential to use neural source filter waveform models for the instrument independent modeling. Um, of course, we are also uh, carrying on the work uh, using the NSF model for music modeling. Uh, for example, one case is the piano sound. As I mentioned before, the piano sound is polyphonic. Uh, currently, we don't have good ideas how, how can we generate sign excitation for the uh, multi uh, excitation or the multiple notes. Uh, for this work, we simply use a noise as excitation. And it turns out it works uh, reasonably good. So I'd like to play two samples. The first one is natural one, then the generous one. generally sound from the ASM model. Yes, this work, this work is still ongoing because we have to explain why it works. Um, probably because we fit in so, many, uh, so, so much data for this uh, work. But it's quite interesting to see how we can produce the, uh, the polyphonic sound from the noise for, for this piano instrument. Uh, the final example is about the room reverberation. Uh, in, in, the, in the previous uh, part of this lecture, we have, uh, we have shown how it, it behaves for the speech sound. But here, I'd like to mention how it works for the music. I, I'd like to first play the sound, which is coming from the network before we add the reverb effect. Then after we adding the reverb. Yeah, probably can perceive uh, for the dry sound, it really sounds like you're uh, playing the violin uh, in the open space. But uh, for the reverb sound, it's like you're playing the violin in the concert hall. So this is the uh, reverb effect, which is good. Um, to improve the perception of the music. Um, having uh, introduced so many uh, different types of networks for the music application, uh, probably you could understand how uh, interesting this topic can be because we can create so many different kinds of uh, applications for entertainment or uh, interactive uh, performance. Uh, and of course, there are some kind of crazy um, uh, applications such like the never ending decimal uh, AI, uh, which just used uh, some kind of language model to produce the decimal uh, music. Um, of course, somebody uh, is anxious about that, but for us, I think we have more things to worry about. Uh, for example, whether we can use a single model to better model the uh, differences across the instrument whether we should just need to use big data plus the large autoregression model instead of building an interpretable model. And final one is whether we can do better for polyphonic uh, music waveform generation, which is quite different from a speech. So that's for the um, music part. And we come to the conclusion. I think Yamagishi-sensei, could you? OK. <laughs> yes. <Actually. laughs> 
good uh, plan <laughs> that oh, I really? can do that. Yep. Yes, um, yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much for staying with us for three hours. Um, so as you could, as you saw um, in this course, we overviews um, like a high level concept and the visual concept of um, non neural and the neural vocoders, which has clear and the cross relationship each other's. Um, so especially we overview three type of vocoders, three type of families, air, source filters, and glottal types, and the plus and cons. Uh, we also mentioned that cross relationship between speech processing, uh, also machine learning. Um, what I'm kind of a little bit worried about is uh, like a like a disjoint, um, like a speech and the music communities. I think those two communities need to be somehow um, merged. And as you could see from a parallel de development of the speech and the music book orders, which is uh, quite similar to each other. Right. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, we taught you, we teach, we taught you like a uh, basic knowledge of signal processing, like uh, reverberations or source filter theory. So I hope you enjoy those courses. Um, after this lectures, um, um, I think George, or maybe we, we upload hands on sessions, uh, which includes the NSF code and uh, Jupyter code and so on. Uh, we also included a pre-trained models. So I think you could enjoy it to generate speech and the music if you want. Shinwan, could you quickly tell me what you could do with those hands-on sessions? Yes, for the hands-on sessions, there are three parts as shown here. The, far, uh, the first part would be uh, the Jupyter notebooks, which you can run on your laptop without using GPU. It basically shows how each uh, block, basic block of the NS model works. So you can play with the code there. Uh, for the second part is just a demonstration on the pre-trained model, as Yamagishi has mentioned, for speech and the music generation. So in that case, you still can use a laptop and you will load the uh, pre-trained model and you will see how the signal is generated from the uh, NS model, how it, it was uh, uh, gradually changes by the future part. Um, and uh, for the final part would be the training scripts. Uh, in that case, you have to download the GitHub page, which is written in the readme of the hands-on session material. And uh, you can just run the command to train a, a NSM model, uh, uh, actually multiple NSM models on the CMU Arctic database. So I hope you enjoy the hands-on session later. Yeah, good. Thank you very much. And I also want to mention that um, so if you download a uh, presentation slide, uh, you could see additional um, 60 slides um, because we drop technical part or mathematical part. Um, although Xinhua and I like those mathematical parts too, but I saw that this is too much. So if you want to know the more technical part or mathematical part, yeah, please have a look at those appendix part, and those would be useful for your further, deeper understanding of those waveform models. Right, um, could you, Shimon, could you go to the next page? I don't remember what we had. All right, just reference. Yeah, just reference, okay. Then I think you can have a look. And then um, I want to, yeah, thank you, those people. Um, I borrowed some of the slides from Simon King. Um, I also want to thank you, Laudi and the Hager. Um, they contributed a part of those um, courses um, behind the scene. Right, so uh, thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Um. Yunichi and Sim, uh, really thank you very much for this uh, uh, nice presentation that uh, includes, uh, as you said, the signal processing knowledge, neural networks, and shows how we can uh, use the models for speech and audio music. Um, yeah, if there are questions, uh, in, uh, first of all, there are some participants from US and they are not able to 
our guests to participate online right now. They will send questions through the Slack channel uh, day yes. two. Um, and other people also uh, can send uh, questions later on. But please, now it's an opportunity. Uh, uh, hello, can, can I ask? Hello? Yes, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, th thank you very much for the presentations. Um, I, I, I actually um, have uh, like a, a little bit concerned about the, the F F0 um, conditions in the NSF because um, uh, you, you, you um, have a, uh, like you use a separate, it's not like separate, but it's, it's jointly trained, but there's like a separate module that is conditioned only on the F0, right? So I'm just concerned about the, uh, about the condition of the mismatch of the F0, like F0 that is unseen in the training data. Um, how will it perform? Like, I mean, yeah, in, in slide 82, I, I guess you have shown that uh, about the modification of the F0, right? But but again, if, if you modify the F0, then naturally the spectrum uh, spectral envelope should also be changed, right? So, so the the it's not probably not so, a bit fair. so probably a, a bit more fair is to use um, out of speakers data, like out of uh, speakers with outside F0 range of the training data, so the spectra is um, matched and. And again, <laughs> in this case, it is a male spectrogram, right? So the male spectrogram already contains F0, and you perform F0 modification, but uh, I don't know how about <laughs> F0 condition in the male spectrogram. And, oh, yes, um, I, I, think, um, I think when you mentioned mismatch, I think uh, there are two types of mismatch here. Uh, one is the F0 range, whether we're seeing the F0 range in the uh, training data or not. Uh, another one is the mismatch of the F0 in terms of the input futures. Uh, I think this picture showing here, uh, my answer is the second case where uh, there is mismatch in terms of F0 information be uh, between the input acoustic futures. But uh, at, at least from this figure, you can see how even if we keep the mirror spectrogram, uh, mirror spectrogram the same, we can still get some kind of uh, output waveform from the uh, after we modified F0. But of course, this is an EO condition. The idea condition would be uh, we use uh, some kind of acoustic features such as uh, mere cape uh, strong coefficients, which does not contain the F0 information. So that this kind of information, uh, this kind of mismatch in terms of acoustic features, don't, do not, does not happen in the uh, when we put the features to the network. But uh, as as you may, as you may realize, this kind of uh, mismatch actually happens in many places. Uh, as long as people don't care about the uh, what kind of future they use. So, for example, people may just uh, like the mere spectrogram, they just fit in. So the question is, again, uh, once we have the mismatch in terms of acoustic futures, how can we control the F0? Um, I think, uh, of course, one way is to change the mere spectrogram. Another way is to keep the mere spectrogram the same, but we provide different ways to change the F0. I think this is one, uh, I, I think one mm, potential application in terms of the, uh, the SM model for that. Uh, for the first case where the F0, F0 range is different, um, I don't have clear answer for that because uh, we are not, <laughs> uh, I know you're working on worse conversion, so uh, um, I have, we, we have never tried that, but uh, at least I, I can see that as long as the uh, well, for normal human beings, as we have, as long as we have uh, large data corpus with uh, different speakers, hopefully we can cover uh, most of the uh, range of the F zero for all types of speakers. Um, I don't know how 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 yes. I, I also have some different um, view on this. So yes. if you don't mind, could you go to slide uh, one hundred ninety seven? <laughs> you can use like a uh, light this table one? mode. Yeah, thank you. So um, yeah, so Patrick said that um, he has some concerns to use F0s as a part of um, 
um, input to the neural vocoders. Um, actually, I don't have any concerns. Actually, I, mean, I, I mean, because I can, because in, in, can, in the case of in, in the case of the NSF, you is uh, clearly separated. I mean, you use F zero yeah, in both so. sites, but uh, you have a clearly please, separate F zero part. So, um, yeah, yeah, please let me explain my another interpretations. Um, so please assume we have um, deep learning based encoders to extract F zeros, like uh, in the figure in the middle. And then those latents are further uh, input to the decoders that generate speech waveform. So, um, so in my opinion, um, NSF is somehow similar to autoencoder-like architectures, where the latents are somehow explicitly or supervisedly trained. Um, we have flow-based um, neural vocoders, we also have gun-based vocoders. So another interpretation is to use uh, F0, so other type of latent, um, is, is actually um, like uh, indications to, like uh, we are heading to VAE-like vocoder architectures, in my opinion. But anyway, um, this is the another way. So if you want to make your neural vocoders robust to um, out of uh, F0 ranges observed in training data. Uh, you have to make your <coughs> uh, generators or decoders to robust to such a, um, unseen ranges, uh, which is also typical issues for autoencoders. And yes. then, uh, you know, some tricks to train the VAE is robust. Um, but anyway, um, so there are some solutions to to make um, our neural vocoders more robust, um, although we haven't tested yet. Yes, for, yes, one, one final um, thing to mention is that, well, if you think there is a mismatch in terms of acoustic features, for the second case, you can add a simple network to predict the F0 from the, for example, the male spectrogram. So in this case, there will be no F0 explicitly. I think uh, it, it could be useful for, for your application, I guess. Um, yeah, 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 okay, okay. Yes. I, I mean, um, yeah, yeah, that's okay, okay, that's fine. Yeah, because I mean, in, in the WebNet case, it's it sounds like all of like similar sounds, because I, I think that in the case of the WebNet, it somehow does not really take into account the F0 condition because the mass spectrogram is probably more dominant. And in, in your case, because you have separate modules that contest F0, so the sounds a little, little bit different. And even though yes. the mass spectrogram has the F0 because- yes. Mm. Yes, uh, great. Uh, from these examples, uh, the WaveNet does not listen to the input layer zero. I think, yes. Um, about uh, NSF can do that because, uh, well, uh, because you use a sine waveform as a strong prior on what kind of waveform we, we can get. Uh, we can go talk about this later, but I think, uh, yes, I agree with that. WaveNet does not listen to the input layer zero. Yeah, I mean, if you use spectral envelope without uh, it's uh, without FGR information, it might be diff different results. I'm not sure, but yes. anyway, th 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 thank you very much. Yeah, agree. I think it depends what kind of um, acoustic future you use. If you use, um, you know, lift tidings, if I use signal processing to, to remove um, pitch informations from spectrum envelope properly, probably you can control spectrum envelope if there was more uh, separated way, but as long as you input the spectrogram, uh, as you see, as you saw from our slide, low frequency part of the spectrograms contain F0 information, so there will be some mismatch between F0 information included in the spectrogram and the F0s given separate, separately. So you need to handle those uh, conflict, con yeah, mismatch and the conflict somehow. Yeah, I, I understand the point that the, in, in the NSF, this, the, because of the possibility of controlling separately the F0 in using the sine, in, in the very basic NSF using the sine wave, yeah. 
this kind of mismatch can be heard in, in the sounds. Yeah, yeah. Even though the acoustic features still contain. Yeah, I think. Thank you. Thanks.